Okay, so now it's ten thirty. Uh, let's start. Uh, this is lecture four for. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, this is CS uh, CS three thirty uh, six three ninety five. This is lecture four, and uh, oh, just remember next Monday is uh, is a holiday, so next class will be next Wednesday. Um, so next Monday is is a break. Uh, there will be no class on next Monday. Okay, um, let's, uh, I still have a few slides left for the uh, networking introduction. So I will finish it in this class. Uh, I would, so this page of slides is important for you to understand the, how the net protocol work. And uh, so I will re repeat it. Uh, so basically internal computers in your home or internal computer, all the computer inside UCF network we are using private IP address. So every computer device in your home is using a private IP address. Private IP address means this IP address will never appear in the global internet. It can only appear in the internal local area network. Uh, when the computer, when your home computer send out, uh, for example, web connection, uh, because uh, uh, I'm using IP, uh, uh, TCP IP, well, uh, this is about the uh, IP layer. So whether the transport is using TCP or UDP, uh, it doesn't matter. So suppose it send out a web request because why is it called web request? Because the destination port number is 80. So destination port is a web service. So these packets source address, source port, destination address, destination port, when the packet arrive at the Wi-Fi router, the Wi-Fi router will change its uh, source IP address to the global IP address assigned to your Wi-Fi router at your home. At your home, you only have one single global IP address. So this is easy to be done. But for UCF network, UCF has, as I said last time, has two slash 16 subnet. So UCF basically pick one global IP address that has not been used by any internal computer assign that IP address to your computer. So, so your computer and another computer inside UCF, when the traffic goes out, uh, you probably will not use the same IP address, will be used two different global IP address. But at your home, all the home computer only has one single global IP address. Uh, this, is a, um, this is a source address. It will be the global IP address assigned to your home by the ISP. Port number will also be changed because the uh, port number will be managed by the Wi-Fi router. Wi-Fi router basically pick unused port number uh, to assign. When the traffic, when this packet goes out to the web server, when the web server respond, when the web server respond, respond to this uh, global IP address, the destination IP address is the Wi-Fi router's global IP address. Remember, this Wi-Fi router has two interfaces. One interface is going to the global ISP, uh, to your ISP provider, which has this global IP address. One interface is going to your internal uh, local area network. Uh, that's why this, uh, uh, this uh, Wi-Fi router, because it has two interfaces, so it has two IP address. Remember, as I said last, last time, uh, how many IP address your computer is using depend on how many how many network interface you are you are using uh, at that moment. So this Wi-Fi router has two IP address, two interface. So when this packet come in, the Wi-Fi router basically look up this uh, translation table and uh, translate address back according to this entry. How do we, how does it find this entry? Uh, for your home Wi-Fi router all the wide area side address is, is exactly the same. So, so finding the entry is solely based on the port number, based on the port number. Uh, that's why the Wi-Fi router needed to control the port number. So it need modify the port number. It needed to have it under its own control. So once it find the entry, it change its uh, destination address to the private IP address, that destination port to the port saved in this entry. 
then it will go to the correct internal computer. So that will form this uh, connection communication loop. Um, so for the global internet, for example, a web server, it can only see that the traffic all come from this single global IP address. But how many computer is behind this single IP address? The web server does not know because all these, all your home computer, if you're all your home computer connect to like amazon.com, Uh, then, then all those computer will be, be looks like from the single user coming to Amazon. Of course, Amazon could use, for example, cookie to distinguish uh, how many user behind this IP address. Um, so there, there, there are many other ways for a web server or other server try to figure out how many user is behind a single IP address. Anyway, this is how the net works. And uh, net address translation, it because it has uh, we have this uh, core number is 16 bit. So in theory, a net device can support more than 60,000 concurrent connections for local area network. So it can support many many computers. Um, uh, 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 of course, uh, if you support many computer in the local area network, like hundreds of computer that will put a lot of burden on the net device because you need to check to modify every package and uh, you need to remember for every package when you modify any packet header you'll need to recompute the checksum in the packet header so if you have many computers that that's a lot of burden to the wi-fi router and the net it's very, the very is, is actually a very successful design. When it was designed in 1980s, people tried to solve these IP address resource issues, but it turned out very to be very successful design. Uh, but it's also controversial because it violates the end-to-end -end argument. Originally, when people design internet, people think that IP address is the unique identifier for every computing device on the internet. So we use IP address to uniquely identify a computing device. But net, after you put net, IP address does not, more, does not correspond to each individual device anymore. For home Wi-Fi, IP address only corresponding to your home Wi-Fi as whole entity. And so it makes internal computers in the private uh, network address, they are not visible to outside. Uh, Right now, it seems uh, we have solved this, this problem, but in early stage, like in early 1990s, when the IP phone or internet meeting gradually come up, this caused a lot of trouble for, for example, for Microsoft net meeting at that time. Um, it happens a lot that you want, to you want to set up net meeting with your friend. Either, either you cannot hear, see his video or, your friend cannot see your video or hear your audio. Basically, sometimes one direction communication is totally blocked because, because of the private IP address you're using or your friend is using a private IP address. So it created a lot of trouble at that time. Uh, that's why Skype quickly come up uh, in 19, early 1990s because Skype solved this problem by its own infrastructure. So gradually Microsoft net meeting is died off. Uh, because of the competition. So at that time, this invisible caused a lot of trouble for many network applications. And uh, outside hosts have trouble to request service from, from local computers inside a private network because local computer inside private network, it's invisible to the global internet. So like a video conference software, like a peer-to-peer -peer application, they all have a lot of trouble to dealing with these uh, invisible issues. And web hosting is also another issue. <clears throat> of course, later on, people find uh, some patchwork to, turn to solve these problems. Like web hosting, if you want to host the web in your home, you need to configure your Wi-Fi router to put in something like a port forwarding um, to make sure that when you when your Wi-Fi router receive a 
web connection from internet, the Wi-Fi router will forward that packet to your internal web server. So that is uh, po called port forwarding. Uh, I will not explain in detail, but uh, you can Google check a little bit port forwarding and uh, to know what does this mean. <coughs> Basically means that means that because here what I what I explain here is all the connection is initiated by internal computer, so that is supported by NAT. But if you set a web server, for example, on 10.0.0.2, well, internet client when they send web connection to this global IP address, your router need to set up the port forwarding so that whenever it receives a package to port 80. The, the Wi-Fi router will forward that, will change the destination address to this uh, particular IP address internally. So your web server could be able to receive this incoming connection request. So that's the port forwarding. And uh, address shortage should instead be solved by IP version six. That's the original design for IP version six. Uh, but cost net was so successful People find that once we use NAT, uh, we don't need to worry about IP address resource shortage anymore. So, so uh, that's why IP version six is very slow in, in adoption by the internet. Anyway, for the for because of the NAT, so internet community defined the three uh, three subnet to be reserved for a private uh, network. So basically, on global internet you should never see a packet that have IP addresses in this three subnet because they all be reserved for private network. Internet router will never forward those packets. Um, like UCF using this uh, subnet because this is very big uh, private subnet. So UCF using this one. And uh, because UCF has a lot of global IP address, so when the, the UCF gateway do this uh, translation, address translation, it is like many global IP address corresponding to this uh, big subnet. Um, a home network, almost every home Wi-Fi router is using this uh, subnet. This is um, slash 16 subnet. That is big enough for any local area network. Um, Actually, many home Wi-Fi router by default configuration, they will either use this uh, 00 slash 24 or they use this 10 slash 24 as a subnet. Uh, this slash 24 subnet means that you can support up to uh, 2 to power 8, basically 256 uh, IP address in the subnet. Of course, you need to remove the first uh, IP address, the last IP address, they are all reserved. So you can support up to 254 IP address in your home network. So that's enough for any home network. Um, and for home Wi-Fi router, it's a single global IP address corresponding to this uh, uh, subnet. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this uh, subnet is reserved for private use, but it's not widely used. Um, it seems that no one uses subnet uh, in their default uh, in their default configuration. Yes. So the one seventy two point sixteen. What's what's the main difference other than fewer IP addresses uh, between that and the one ninety two point six eight? Uh, this one actually has a larger IP address. Okay. Because uh, this is a slash x, when the slash number subnet number is smaller, that means yeah. the address is bigger. Yeah. So why would you not use that one? Why, why use 192.168 instead of 170? Yeah, the question is uh, why all the home Wi-Fi are using this one subnet instead of this subnet? Uh, I don't. I think there is no particular reason because uh, you can use either one. Um, is it something you're able to choose when you set up a router or something? So if you set up a router, for example, later on when I want to introduce virtual machine you will use a virtual box. It's a similar to VMware. In virtual box, you can set up a private subnet, a virtual private subnet. In that, you can change the configuration. You can use this subnet or you can use this subnet. 
by default, the virtual box private subnet is actually using this 10, uh, this, uh, uh, this subnet, but you can change the configuration. Uh, why home Wi-Fi router all using this one? I think it's just a habit is uh, every, everyone use that. So, so, uh, so all the routers, they basically use this one. So there's no difference uh, here. And, uh, and another reason is because slash 16 and slash 24, why we use the slash 16, slash 24, slash eight instead of slash 12? Because every in IP address, every decimal value is eight bits. So it's very natural you are using like a fix the first two bytes or fix the first three bytes for the subnet. And also very easy to compute. Like a slash 16 just means the first two bytes is fixed. Slash 24 means the first three bytes in the IP address is fixed. So that's very convenient for a human mind to think. Um, and another IP address is reserved. It's uh, 127.0.0.1. It's called loopback address. Basically, if, you, if the outgoing IP address is this one, then this packet will never send out. It will come back to the, to, to the computer itself. So it's called a loopback address. Okay, so that's the IP addressing and IP addressing, just remember the subnet, how do you interpret a subnet? Then how do you and understand the net address, network address translation? These are two very important concepts in network addressing. And another knowledge I want to you, everyone understand is DNS. Um, DNS is responsible for resolving a host name to IP address. Because for human mind, it's very easy for us to remember a uh, English name like uh, bankamerica.com or amazon.com. But for a computer, everything is based on digit, based on number. So computer find, find the other based on IP address. But IP address is very hard for human to remember. So when internet gradually become a global network, people quickly designed this uh, network uh, domain name service, uh, uh, make this address translation. So for human, you can type in amazon.com on your web browser. Then the web browser will send DNS uh, request to DNS server to find out what's the actual IP address for amazon.com. So you can think that this is like a dictionary, is, uh, is uh, tell you what's the IP address for a domain name. And for the domain name, it, it was designed in the hierarchical way. Uh, the most significant domain is the last one, is the last, everything after the last dot. So this is called top level domain. Uh, sometimes you will see TLD. TLD just means top level domain. Um, so top level domain uh, is, uh, is, well, above top level domain is the root server. So in, in internet, there are 13 root DNS server distributed around the world. Uh, after that is the top level domain. So top level domain, each one is, is in charge by a particular company, just in charge of that top level domain. Then the second level domain usually is a company name, like UCF.edu. The .edu is a top level domain. Uh, it, is, it is managed by one particular company. Uh, .com is also a top level domain. It's managed by another particular company. And so the second level domain usually is a company name. So that when you set up a company, when you try to get a domain name, uh, this you basically determine this one, uh, my domain name. And uh, the third one usually is a host name inside the company. So in UCF, we have many web server. So every web server has its uh, web server's unique name, um, like uh, my.ucf.edu, like uh, cs.ucf.edu. So that is each web server inside that uh, business, inside that company or organization. Uh, usually the domain name is like that. Of course, you can have the fourth level. For example, in computer science, we can have like a moron.cs.ucf.edu. So that is all the web server managed by computer science. 
So UCF, no, the UCF uh, campus network, they will not manage those internal computer anymore. So most, most likely we have these three level of the domain for every, for every computing device. And uh, for domain name resolution, basically uh, suppose uh, this is your computer, uh, your laptop at school. Uh, 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 remember, I'm using slides uh, from the James Group's uh, textbook. So this, uh, 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 the, uh, this example is also from, from his select slides. Uh, this is uh, Jim Cruz is a faculty in UMass. So suppose you try to get a web browser, you try to browse this uh, computer science so web page. And uh, you basically send yes, your web browser. When once you type in this domain name in the web browser, your web browser sends DNS request to local DNS server. So when whenever your computer gets IP address from the Wi-Fi router or from from your from your local area network, you not only get IP address, you also get uh, the IP address for local DNS server. So they all given to you by the DHS server. So your DNS request will go to local DNS server. If the local DNS server has the cached value of the IP address, it will directly tell you the result. Lost this one? Is it working? No, it doesn't. Sorry, I'm Okay. I'll go back and check them and I'll come back with this. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. I, I think the microphone only uh, affect uh, the Pinocchio recording, uh, the Zoom recording because Zoom recording is doing through my computer, my laptop, so it is not affected. But if you see Pinocchio recording, it will affect it by this microphone. Um, anyway, so if the local DNS server has the cache value of the IP address for this destination web server, it directly tell you result. If local DNS server does not have the cache, it will ask, um, well, probably it will not go to the root DNS server. It will ask a uh, uh, top level domain, like a .edu, what's the IP address for umass.edu? So it will go this. The two and three will rarely happen. The two and three only happens when the local DNS server does not know what's the IP address for the top level domain, uh, .edu. But the top level domain, almost every DNS server knows its IP address. So it doesn't need to go to the root. So it will go directly go to the .edu DNS server, ask what's the, what's the UMass .edu's uh, authority DNS server, what's IP address for that? Once it gets answer, it will go to that authoritative, authoritative DNS server. Uh, of UCF.edu. So uh, then it will get what's the IP address for this domain. Authoritative DNS server basically for every organization when you apply for a domain name for your organization, you also need to tell the DNS system what's the authoritative DNS server uh, you have. You have you have to have one or one or several authority DNS server. This authority DNS server basically is official answering machine, answering what's the IP address for any computer inside your organization. So these, uh, these uh, authority DNS servers IP address and domain name, it will be registered in this uh, top level domain. So top, top level domain only know these ones IP address. It doesn't know any internal computers IP address. So once it goes here, it will get the final answer, then it can return that answer to your laptop. So that's the basic step. So step two and three rarely happen because almost every local DNS server 
have the cash the value of the top level domain uh, DNS server's IP address. So it doesn't need to go to the root. Uh, another thing I want to emphasize for TNS service is that by default, TNS service using UDP for the protocol. Why it use UDP? Because it will be fast and also it will save the bandwidth. Uh, because usually when you send TNS query, you only send a single packet. The single packet is enough. Then the response, DNS server response is also can be put in a single UDP packet. So you just send DNS query, you get one packet DNS response. So that's just a two packet to finish the service. However, if you use TCP, that means you first need to set up the three-way packet handshake to set up TCP connection. Then you send a query, a response, then you need to tear down this TCP connection. So that's a lot of packet and overhead for, uh, for a sim simple, simple, query and response things. And another thing is that if you use DNS, you don't need to wait for the TCP connection to set up. You direct send packet to get response. So you don't need to wait for that uh, time delay. Uh, that's why by default, DNS using, using UDP. Of course, DNS can also use TCP as well. Uh, both are supported. Um, uh, uh, of course, when you use DNS, it means that the packet error can only be detected by the, by the application layer because transport layer does not guarantee reliable data transfer. So DNS program, service program, you need uh, the program itself need to check whether the packet has any bit error in it or not. Um, so if you have a bit error, just uh, throw it away and send another query. So that's the DNS. Um, okay, uh, probably uh, in, uh, later on when we use uh, set up virtual machine using Linux machine, Linux, Linux virtual machine, we will do some DNS operation. Then you will know more detail about DNS. Uh, just remember, Every organization, when you try to get the domain name, you not only need to specify what's the name for my organization, you also need to specify what's the authoritative DNS server that in charge of my organization. Um, so that will be registered in this top level domain. Okay, another concept that I want to introduce is ARP. Address resolution protocol. It is actually belong to the data link layer. It will never go beyond data link layer. So it is only used for local area network. Um, the whole responsibility service for ARP is determining the MAC address of a host within a subnet. Because within a subnet, your addressing is actually not using IP address anymore. You are using data link layer address, so-called MAC address. And um, so if a host like inside your network want to communicate with another local host, uh, it knows that it is in the local area network, uh, then it will send an ARP request. So ARP packet, it, it's, it's actually a broadcast message in the local area network. Ask who is, who is at this IP address. Then every local, area, local, every computer in local area network will see this ARP query message because it's a broadcast. Then if this particular computer, uh, because it knows that it has this IP address, then this host will, will give a response, ARP response. The response will not be broadcast anymore. It's just directly sent to the query machine and saying that my MAC address is what you ask. Then after that, the sending machines knows what's a MAC address, a MAC address and IP address matching, they all belong to the same computer. Then it can directly communicate with this, uh, with this computer using this MAC address. 
So this, uh, this is ARP. So ARP is a very simple protocol. It only is conducted in local area network. And uh, the query is a broadcast message. The response is not a broadcast message. Uh, reverse ARP is responsible for the exact opposite. Basically, uh, what's the IP address for a computer that has a particular MAC address? So that's the reverse ARP. Um, I want to introduce a basic concept, but I will not introduce the detail. ARP, uh, you just need to understand what is ARP, and that's it. Uh, that's it. Why we introduce ARP? Because in, for many attack, when they attack local area network, they will try to poison the ARP protocol and, um, and, and also block some ARP query and response. Make sure that you think you are talking with a real computer with this MAC address, but you're actually talking to the attacker's computer because they have poisoned this ARP response, ARP query. Another protocol called ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol. Um, in the early stage of internet, ICMP is widely used because ICMP is the main goal for ICMP is try to diagnose the, the network connection. In the early stage of internet, the network is not reliable. The link always frequently break, router uh, frequently turns off. So, before, when you, whenever you find that you cannot connect to your friend to another IP address, you basically can use ICMP packet to find out whether this link is going through, what's the round trip time for this link, uh, on which part of this link has this uh, connection being broke. So that is uh, diagnosis. Basically, it's for diagnosis reason. Um, of course, right now, end user usually don't pay attention to this one anymore. It is only used by a system, system administrator. So ICMP packet is, uh, is, uh, is on the IP layer. So it doesn't use IP, it doesn't use any TCP or UDP transport protocol because it doesn't use any transport protocol. It directly built on top of IP layer. Um, the message is uh, simple. It just have this several type and code. There are more type and code, but I will not in introduce those one. The, the most uh, important uh, type of message is this uh, echo reply and echo re request. Uh, these are used by the PIN program. PIN program basically try to find whether I can connect to a particular destination IP address. Um, so, it's called PIN request. In PIN request, your computer will basically send ICM, ICMP message with this type A in itself. Uh, another ICMP message is a TL uh, expire. So it's a type 11. So whenever a router receives a packet that the IP header, the TTL value is equal to zero, the router will drop that packet. Then whenever the route dropped the packet, router will send this uh, type 11 ICMP message to the source. Basically tell source that uh, your packet has been dropped by me because of the TTL value expired. So that's the uh, default configuration for all the router. And so this is uh, TTL value expire is important because it is utilized by the Chris route um, program. This route program based what's the 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 the, uh, the usage of trace route program is basically find out what's the network path between my computer and the particular destination computer, and uh, and also find out uh, how many router it goes through, where these routers are on the internet, what's the round trip time between my computer and uh, all the router on the path. So trace route. Suppose this is your computer. You want to find out what's actual link to a destination, for example, web server, then you use the TraceRoute program. TraceRoute program will send three packets that has TTL value equal to one. Basically, it sends three uh, ping message with TTL value equal to one. 
then they will actually be dropped by the first uh, router because route, remember every router will reduce TTR value by one then send it out. Because the TR value is zero, the router will send uh, this uh, so-called uh, type 11 message back to the source and tell the sender that uh, the packet has been expired. Yes. So if a packet loses, um, uh, the TTL counter goes down by one for every router that sends goes through, how do things like Tor work? Tor jumps from router to router mm -hmm. to hide, to mask from your actual location. Oh. But wouldn't that make the packet expire before they reach the destination they're trying to get to? Yeah, so the question is that if the TTL value drop to zero, it will be dropped by the router, then how does the Tor work? Tor is a T-O-R, you can Google search Tor. It's an anonymous network. Basically, many users join this uh, Tor network. So each one of your computer will behave like the sender receiver and also as a forwarder. So you can receive a packet from the Tor network, then the Tor program on your computer will, will send it out to another Tor member computer in the network. So in this way, it can blend this sender receiver trace, basically try to make sure you cannot trace where this packet comes from. The question is that if the packet goes through many nodes in this Tor network, will it be dropped because of TTL value? Uh, the answer is no, because this uh, TTL value is used by the network layer. Tor network is an application uh, program. So this forwarding is done by the Tor software, Tor program running on your computer. So that computer, uh, that program can, can, for example, reset this uh, TTR value, assign a different TTR value to the packet. So it can make sure that the packet will not be dropped because of the TTR value equal to zero stuff. Okay. Yeah. So for Trisla, the first the three packet has TTL value one, it will be dropped by the first router. The router will send back this uh, SMP packet to tell your sender that the packet has been dropped. Then from this response, the trace route program will know what's the first IP address for the first router and what's the round trip time between myself and the first router. Because router drop it and immediately send the notification. So you know the round trip. Then this route will send another three packet with TTL value equal to two. So it will be dropped by the second router. Second router also tell you uh, it's been dropped. So you know the second router's IP address and also run through time. And this route just do this recursively until it reaches the destination. So, you do, so in this way, you know how many hops this packet goes through, uh, in which physical link this packet goes through. So that's a trace route. Uh, in Windows computer, uh, in Windows computer, the program trace route is called trace RT. So you can do this trace route from your home. Uh, this is one screenshot from my home. So the first one is actually, if you do it from your home, the first one will, will be your home Wi-Fi router. So usually home Wi-Fi router will use a dot one as its default IP address, but uh, it depends on the Wi-Fi router default configuration. So the first uh, hop is your Wi-Fi router, and the second hop will go through this uh, global, your ISP. So eventually you can see that second router, third router, some routers will have a domain name assigned by that ISP. So you can figure out uh, uh, where this uh, router is based on the domain name. So you can see this domain name is uh, Orlando and uh, PHN brighthousenetwork.net. So this, this uh, router belong to Bright House. It's in the Orlando area. And uh, this uh, three value is the wrong time because you have three packets. For every packet, you have a wrong trip time. And, uh, uh, and uh, this one is uh, Orlando level level three, and uh, and here is the Miami area, and uh, this is at Miami, and this is Google Google Inc. ad. So basically, when I when I connect to Google at that moment, 
uh, I'm actually connecting to a Google server in Miami area. So from this tree saw, you can basically see how many hops it goes through and where this uh, traffic goes through. Um, you, you can do it at, at a school, but at UCF, but UCF uh, gateway will block this uh, ping message, this SAMP message. Because SAMP message, is for network diagnosis, at the same time, it can be used by a typer, try to figure out what's the situation structure for your internal network. So UCF uh, 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 gateway will block all this uh, ping message and also this uh, PTL expire message, SMP message. So if you do that here, um, Yeah, yeah you, you basically will get a uh, timeout, timeout. This uh, star just means timeout. Basically, it doesn't receive any response. So it timeout. Uh, it's either because of the router stop responding to, the, to, to this uh, drop message. By default, routers should respond when it drop a packet. But the router can be configured to be, to, to be silent. <laughs> Again, this is reason because uh, because uh, administrator for that router don't want the router to reveal its identity to any other people. So they could drop the packet. And after a few hops, all this will be timed out because the UCF gateway uh, just uh, dropped all this SMP message. So you can do this experiment at your home, not uh, in, in UCF network. And if I do trace route to a university in another country, for example, this is a university in, uh, in China. I graduated from that with undergrad degree. Uh, you can see that it goes through a uh, cable spring. This is a roadrunner, rr.com is a roadrunner. So at that time, I, I'm using roadrunner ISP. Uh, and this is Orlando, Orlando. Uh, Dallas, so you can see the name, you know that it goes to Dallas, it goes to Los Angeles, and uh, this is the uh, edge, edge router in Los Angeles. Then it goes to China Netco, so edge Los Angeles. So you can see this jump of the wrong time. So this jump is because it goes through this uh, uh, Pacific Ocean, so that is a transmission delay for the, for, for the electronic signal. So that's a big jump. So you can see that this router is in Los Angeles. This router is actually in China uh, because of this uh, round trip time. You can immediately figure out that. After that, uh, uh, this router inside China, they, they don't have a domain name. So we don't know uh, where there is, but you can find out where each IP address is by using, remember last time I mentioned uh, um, IP address location. Um, so if you don't, so basically you can uh, copy one IP address and input here. Uh, for example, you put IP address here, then click IP lookup. Uh, then it will tell you what's the geolocation for that particular IP address. So you can use this way to find uh, find some information. Uh, like uh, this IP address is uh, belong to Massachusetts Amherst because this is uh, that uh, a UMass computer science web server's IP address. And uh, it will tell you the geolocation information. Okay, so that's the uh, case route. And you can also do this route actually not from your own computer. You can, there are many web server that can provide this trace route for you. Of course, when you do trace route from those web server, it is actually to start from that web server's IP address. Um, uh, you can try many different trace route program. Some trace route uh, service, they will actually give you a, a global graph to show actually to show where each router on this path uh, in this the geolocation uh, graph. So give you those information. Um, 
Okay, the last concept I want to briefly touch is this uh, web protocol. Um, because the number one network application in the internet is still the web. So you need to understand a little bit about web protocol. Uh, web, web, uh, World Wide Web using HTTP protocol. Of course, right now, almost all the network connections, they use HTTPS for security reason. But the basic uh, protocol is HTTP. HTTPS is just doing encryption. So the fundamental communication is still HTTP. And um, so for any URL, uh, URL is basically has two components. One is the host name, another is a path name and object name. So, so this host name will determine what web server you are connecting to. This class name will basically tell the, tell the destination web server what object I want to get from, from your server. So class name could have some directory information um, or it, it could just have this uh, uh, object name. Um, so the object is addressed by URL and uh, web page. Every web page will actually consist of a base HTML text file. So this HTML file is a pure text file. And uh, it also could include many reference objects. So like a picture, video on a web page or, or animation uh, image on a web page, they all called object for a web page. Um, for example, uh, for example, my page is a very simple uh, web page. The web page contains a base HTML text file. So all these text is in this base HTML and also has some, some object like this a background mountain is a picture. So it's a very simple background mountain picture. So that's one object of my pocket is object. Uh, this uh, Chinese name is actually a picture, so, so it, it's another object. So basically, my, my web page contains three picture objects and, and one base HTML file. It's, it's a very simple page. And many other uh, uh, websites, they contain many, many more objects on them, many pictures and videos. Okay. And uh, oh, another question I want to explain that, of course, in my URL here, I only have a domain name and the path. The path only has a directory name, but doesn't have the base HTML uh, name. Because for, for web browser, if you type in a domain name, if you type in a domain name without object name, it will use a default object. Default object is a, is the default HTML name. Usually it's, uh, it's called index.html or index.htm or, or, or another. So there are several default uh, 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 HTML file names that if you don't supply, it will just use them to, to go to your page to get it. Like, like here is uh, not found, but uh, I don't know what's the default web page for CS. But if you go to CS without the default web page, it will load the default page from the web server. And uh, if a directory, uh, suppose. If if I use a use a URL without uh, oh. if I use a URL without uh, uh, object name, if under that directory there is no default HTML page, then this uh, web web browser will basically get the web server will basically return uh, the entire 
folders information. It's just like a file folder uh, to show to the uh, 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 to show to the client. Um, because under this uh, directory, I don't have a default like index.html page in it. So if you go to that URL, then it will show the default folder information. Uh, basic HTML, uh, HTTP, HTTP request is called HTTP get command. So HTTP is a very simple protocol. Remember, it was designed in late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it only has several commands. It's a very simple command. The get command is a get the get object. So basically, this part is a pass field. Remember, URL has these two parts. In get command, you only need to put uh, this pass name uh, in that because you already you have already connected to the web server. So get this object uh, URL part, then HTTP protocol normally is 1.1. So right now we are still using 1.1. 1.0 uh, has some problem, has some issue. So people quickly design 1.1. And after that, 1.1 is, is fine. So it has never been upgraded yet. It's 1.1. Then the host basically tell where the host to get the object. Um, and then after that, uh, some header lines. The header line basically defines some additional parameters for this uh, get command. For example, uh, the web browser can, can tell the web server that please keep my connection live for uh, 115, 115 seconds. So you can tell the browser something that you want. Um, like connection keep alive, keep alive for this, uh, for this amount of seconds. And also the information is uh, encoded in uh, uh, using what kind of compression algorithm. Suppose you find, suppose you want to get some file from the web server. Web server for some bigger file, they will actually send compressed format to you to save the bandwidth. So this one, basically tell the web server that I can accept encoding by using this compression uh, algorithm. Like uh, if you send me a zip, I can decompress. But if you send me a file compressed by some other program, I cannot uh, decompress, I cannot recognize it. So these are just uh, some, some additional parameters uh, the client want to tell the server that, that uh, to facilitate uh, to facilitate the future com uh, communication. User agent basically of server, what kind of browser I'm using? Because for different browser, the web page may be designed slightly different. Uh, clearly, like when you browse uh, my.ucf.edu by computer, it will be very different when you browse my.ucf.edu from your smartphone. Your smartphone browser is very different from computer browser. So for different browser, the web server, based on this information, the web server will, will respond with different web page. And uh, one empty line will represent the end of this uh, get command. Uh, in the early stage, in, in early 1980s, there's no encryption. Everything is uh, plain text on the internet. So, so uh, everything here is in ASCII text. So it's easy for human to read. So you can manually send this command uh, by, your, by your hands. Uh, you don't need to rely on software program. So, so, so everything is per text. Use one empty line to say that's the end of all the header lines. And for web server response, if the web server has the object, the web server response will be HTTP 200 OK. So 200 is the status code is for easy for computers to understand. This uh, OK is, uh, is for him to understand. So the HTTP protocol was designed, remember, in early stage. So it's tried to make sure that it can understand easily both by computer program and also by human eyes. Um, so it has both 200 OK, uh, both are here.
Then this is response also has the headlines. Um, the headlines will determine like uh, what's the server version, what's the date and time, uh, what's the content length, uh, how big is this uh, response. Because the response could be put in multiple packets to the browser, right? So you need to tell the browser how big is my response here. And then the data here, the content type will tell you what's the encoding method. So everything is the text is the ASCII read readable format. So response status code is uh, 200 OK. And uh, this is a uh, request. So if you send a URL, that cannot be understood by the server, server send bad request. But 404 appear the most, not found, because if you request a, a object that is not that does not exist on the web server, the web server will send you this uh, 404 not found uh, 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 response. Um, okay, so, so that's uh, basic for the here. And later on, when I introduce Wireshark, we will use web web traffic as example to introduce Wireshark. Then we, we will introduce more about this uh, query and response for the HTTP for the web request response. Uh, any questions here? Yes. Uh, information in the HTTP is everything here is on application layer. On the application layer, it has nothing to do with the transport layer, network layer. So on transport layer, basically, is if the packet goes to web server, it will have the web server's uh, uh, no um, port number will be port eighty for HTTP is port eighty for HTTPS is port four forty three. So that's the transport and net and IP layer stuff. Um, everything here is about app application layer. Application layer program just means if you push down these data, you can assume the other end will receive the data without any error. So because TCP provide reliable data transfer. So once you use the send command, send out on the receiver computer, in the, in the program side, you can say when the call the receive function call, whatever you received will be 100% accurate, everything you have received because reliable data transfer is done by the transport, by the operating system. So you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so next uh, is a overview of network encryption. Um, Uh, again, this is actually also from this book, uh, because this book has one big chapter on networking security. So mm, the most content is from, from that chapter. Um, in, uh, in network encryption, in this uh, language of cryptography, people usually use this kind of paradigm to illustrate the concept, because in internet communication, it's a uh, point-to-point -point communication. So People say Alice and talk with Bob. Basically, you can think that uh, node A, computer A, talk with computer B. And uh, when when node A sends some data, we call it plain text. The data will go through Alice encryption algorithm using encryption key uh, K A, and it becomes cipher test and transmit on the internet. And uh, attacker is 2D or say uh, 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 intruder, the attacker may be eavesdrop, may, may intercept this uh, cipher test, may drop some cipher test, but the cipher test just means it is unreadable by, by, the, by the intruder. For the receiver part, receiver using decryption algorithm, 
using the decryption key in order to recover the pen text. So depend on the relationship of Ka and Kb, there are two classes of cryptography. Uh, if Ka equal to Kb, then it's called a symmetric key cryptography. Basically, sender and receiver using the identical key for both encryption and decryption. And uh, if the Ka and the Kb they are different. It's like a pair of matching key. You can only use one key for encryption, another key for decryption. In that case, it's called a public key cryptography. Uh, it's called public key cryptography because one key is called public key. Basically, it can be, you can make it public to everyone. Another key is called private key. It just means you need to keep that private key secret. You do not reveal it to anyone. So that's called public key cryptography. And uh, the, the straightforward encryption is a symmetric key the cryptography. Uh, we, in that textbook, they use M to represent plain text message and uh, encryption, they use this notation to represent. Uh, for some textbook, they use this notation to represent encryption. Uh, but for James Cruz uh, textbook, it uses this to represent this encryption function, encryption using this key. But for some other textbook, they use this to show that it, 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 it's actually doing encryption and using this uh, key working on this uh, message. And uh, encryption for the receiver, it uh, basically run the same algorithm again using this key for the second time, then you can recover the original message. Um, so the biggest challenge for symmetric key cryptography is that how do you share this uh, identical key between send and receiver before you have a secure channel? Because you use this encryption key, try to have a secure channel to transmit something in, uh, uh, secretly. But before you have a secure channel, how can you share this, uh, this uh, identical key? Um, especially on, in, on the cyber world, when the sender and receiver, they cannot, they cannot see each other. Um, so that's a bigger challenge for symmetric key cryptography. Uh, the first the modern symmetric key cryptography is called DS is a data encryption standard. Um, DS was actually designed in late 1960s, early 1970s. But at that time, it's a government secret. It only became a public standard in 1993. So you can see that it has been kept as the country secret for 20 years. Um, so TS, uh, it's called the blockchain encryption. Uh, basically, it's doing encryption for every block of plain text. <laughs> so this uh, plain text is 64-bit uh, plain text. So if you have a stream, <laughs> yes, any questions? OK. Um, so. Every 64 bit will be treated as one chunk of plain text. Then the encryption key is a 56 bit encryption key. And, um, and so in late 1960s, people think this encryption key is uh, big enough. Encryption key 56 bit means that you can have up to two to power 56 different encryption key. So that's enough to deal with any uh, exhaustion attack. Uh, but because computing, quick computing device quickly uh, exponentially increased the power. So in early 1990s, uh, this encryption key space is not big enough anymore. You, you can use supercomputer to exhaust every key in this key space uh, to brute force to find the encryption. So, uh, in 1990s, uh, uh, US government uh, used uh, another uh, symmetric key cryptography to replace DS. Uh, so however, DS is widely used for more than 20 years. 
it has been built in many software and also in many hardware chips. So it's not for you just uh, throw them out uh, immediately. Um, so people find a way to extend the lifetime for DS by using the so-called triple DS. Basically, you are using the same software module or same hardware chip, still is a DS encryption algorithm building that hardware chip, but you run this encryption three times. The first time you use the first 56-bit uh, encryption, uh, encryption key, second round, you, you use the second 56-bit encryption key. So, so you run it three times, then you basically expand your encryption key by three times. So that will solve this uh, key space issue of DS. Because DS still people have not found any backdoor in it, no vulnerability being detected. So we can simply expand the key space to solve this brute force problem. So we, we can reuse the existing software module or hardware chip on the DS encryption. Um, DS, uh, this is the architecture for the DS. So this page is important for you to understand the concept. Um, so remember, this is a 56-bit encryption key. This is uh, data is every 64-bit as the input data. Uh, first, uh, this encryption key will be expanded into 16 keys. Each key is 48-bit. So this is a predetermined uh, expansion. So there's nothing secret there. Everyone knows this. Uh, of course, these uh, 16 keys, they are not independent. They are all depend on the original 56-bit key. So first, uh, for the data, you first do a permutation. Permutation is like a shuffling a poker card. You just uh, shift the position of every bit in that, uh, in that data. Uh, again, this, uh, this uh, shuffling. Uh, this shuffling is uh, predetermined, so there's no secret here. Attacker also know this shuffling. Then, this is 32-bit, uh, right side 32-bit, left side 32-bit. Uh, you can see the design is always keep in mind of the computing. Computing device is using two to power something for its uh, notation and using bytes. So everything is a multiply of, of eight bits. So this is 32 bits, basically four bytes. This is four bytes. So this is the first round. Then you use the 32 by 30, 32 bits, 32 bits input this. Uh, this is uh, called a substitution box and Another input is this first key, K1. This uh, substitution box, you can think that it's like a three-dimension lookup table. The three-dimension you're using this uh, L1, R1, and K1 as index on this uh, three-dimension lookup table. Then this table, the entry, that corresponding entry is, is output value of this uh, substitution box. So that's the output value from this uh, three-dimension lookup table. Uh, so that will be the right side 32-bit for the second round. The left side 32-bit will be directly moved down of this R1 um, without any operation. So that's the first round uh, encryption. And you go through actually the same operation, go through the second round. In second round, this uh, substitution box is different. So in every round, the substitution box, the content in substitution box is different, but the whole operation will be exactly the same. So you can see the operation is three input and one output, these three input, one output. So the operation is exactly the same. The only difference is that in every substitution, every round of substitution, the substitution box, the content of that table is uh, different. And uh, you go through this actually 16 round. And finally, you do one last permutation, shuffling, then you get a cipher test. So, so, so that's the overall procedure for DS. 
And you can see that this, uh, shuff, this uh, substitution box used 16 times. Uh, that means uh, this design will make sure that uh, you can reuse the hardware circuit 16 times. The only difference is that when you reuse this uh, substitution operation circuit, the three input and also the substitution box con table, substitution table content feed into this uh, circuit is different. So, so TS was designed with a computer hardware in mind to make sure that you can design a hardware chip very conveniently. Everything will be run multiple times. So you, the hardware of circuit, you just design one part and run it 16 times. So that's the DES. And actually all the modern uh, symmetric key encryption, they are using the same principle for the design. Yes, any questions? Any question? No, they're, they're actually delayed. There, there's a slight delay. So, uh, oh, you I mean? Get much mess. Well, you, yeah, actually you can. So, but there's they're still a little bit delayed. Like, I think they're about five minutes behind. So you can watch them. And the people at home, you know, have, have a video land and watch them. And uh, they're, they're delayed, I think, by about five minutes. Not because that's by design, but just because there's just an inherent delay in the system. So, you know, um, you know, I don't think that's, I, you know, you guys are graduate students. I trust that you're going to do the right thing for yourself, for your education. Well, I, I think some students are uh, looking to see the Zoom fine. Sure. Now, I'm actually tonight, I'm going to cram in a lecture and a lab because we have Thursdays and football games. So I'm going to try to get them both done if I can. Should be up. You know I need to drive? I brought a few extras. Uh, All right, nice. Okay, so if you cannot see this uh, Zoom video clearly in the real time, uh, if your network uh, connection is not good, then you can wait for the after the class. You can see this uh, Zoom recording. Zoom recording will be clear. Um, okay, and one student asked question. It's a fifty-six bit encryption key, why we are using 48 bit. Um, well, that is uh, designed by the by this uh, developer. So why they use 48 bits for each key, uh, there's no clear reason. So we'll find out tonight. Leah, wait, wait, can you mute your mic, please? Because you keep interrupting the professor. OK. Can, uh, sorry, I, I don't, I didn't, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, well, I don't, I don't, something's wrong, but I'm going to get off and get on a place where I can run it. Okay. Well, uh, some student question I cannot hear clearly. So if that's the case, uh, try to type in your question in the chat. Then I can answer the chat one by one. So that may be most convenient um, because of the bandwidth issues. So the developer developed in, uh, in this way, there's no clear reason. Actually, one confusing, one puzzling part is how do the developer design this uh, substitution box? Because every substitution box has a lot of uh, entry in this table. So the entry is a value in every table's entry seems very random. And many researchers after this uh, uh, has finished, uh, they, they, quite, they, they question how do you choose this value in this table? It seems randomly chosen. Maybe there's a back door hidden somewhere, uh, but still people haven't found any back door yet. So it seems that the table entry is very up, uh, 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 arbitrarily chosen, so you can uh, you can see like uh, as you can S box, you can Google search S box, uh, which is uh, this uh, substitution box used in TS. So this one you uh, a snap a snippet, basically a small fraction 
of the S5, basically the fifth round of the substitution box in DES. Um, so this is index, and this is that uh, box entry. It only gave a small fraction, so it only showed four bit. Uh, so it seems every entry in this uh, box, in this table is randomly chosen. Uh, there's no clear rules there. So how do the developer design this is not really clear. So after DES become not adequate anymore, uh, the, the government uh, select another standard, another algorithm called AES, and it becomes standard in 2001. And, um, and right now we are still using AES for the old government communication. Um, okay, okay I, I will explain this one uh, later, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think I, uh, I can finish this slide in next Wednesday's class because it's, it's short, it's only 24 page of slides. Okay, so remember next Monday there will be no class and uh, we'll have next, next class in next Wednesday time. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, assignment, uh, there's no assignment to in the first uh, three weeks. I will release the first assignment in the third week. Thank you.